There we go. Okay, here we go. People are starting to trickle in. All right. Good morning. And I'm sorry. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Buen First. I'm manager of knowledge mobilization here at the Leslie Harris Center of Regional Policy and Development. And I am going to be uh, your host and moderator for this session. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, for this latest Thriving Regions research discussion. Uh, and the, um, the research project we are going to discuss today is Salmon Aquaculture, Can Diet Increase Adaptability? Uh, before we, we begin, and I tell you a little bit more about how this research came about, uh, I want to acknowledge that the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse indigenous groups. And we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of Beothuk, Mi'kmaq, Inu, and Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on these lands from where you are located this morning and to consider the indigenous peoples for whom these lands are traditional territory. Today's session looks closely at Eric Ignatz's recently completed research on aquaculture in the Burin region as part of the Harris Center Striving Regions partnership process uh, in that part of the province. Um, we managed to do our uh, first two workshops just before the COVID. Uh, so there were some delays as you would expect, but uh, here we are today. Uh, Eric's research asked um, two very important questions. Um, he, will changing the diet of salmon increase their tolerance to rising ocean temperatures? And what are the associated issues and implications for aquaculture in Newfoundland and Labrador? And today we are going to hear some answers. Before we hear from, our, from Eric and from our panelists, um, I want to set aside that second half of this session for everybody's questions. So for the second part, um, we are going to come to you. Uh, you can use the Q&A session to post your questions. I will occasionally ask my colleague, Chris Patterson, um, to check the session, to Q&A section and see if there are any questions. And he will ask them on your behalf, or you can also type your questions in the chat. Uh, remember, we are recording today's session and the session will be posted online afterwards on the Harris Center website. It usually takes about two days for the session to be on the website. So let's meet our panelists. Uh, first, we have Eric Ignatz. He is third year uh, PhD student here at Memorial University and under the co-supervision co of Dr. Kurt Gamperow and Dr. Matt Rice, Eric's research focuses on studying different mitigation strategies that could be of use to the Atlantic salmon aquaculture industry to help offset the negative realities of climate change. Eric believes that the industry must be proactive if they are to sustainably expand production at sea and therefore research like his is crucial to ensuring that the aquaculture sector adapt to rising ocean temperatures. Welcome, Eric. Then we have uh, Danny Boyce, Danny is the facility and business manager for the Dr. Joe Brown Aquatic Research Building in the Department of Ocean Sciences at Memorial University of Newfoundland. And you can see that amazing facility in Danny's background. Um, he has been engaged in multiple aspects of aquaculture since the early 90s. He is also a member of numerous professional associations and has volunteered his time on numerous working groups, boards, committees over the years, such as the Newfoundland Aquaculture Industry Association. He currently sits on its executive team as treasurer. In addition, Danny plays an advisory and technical role to various government departments, organizations, and industry-led projects. 
We are also very happy to welcome Dr. Tillman Benfei. Dr. Benfei is a professor of biology and the director of animal care at the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton, where he has an active research program in fish physiology that focuses on improving fish performance in aquaculture. Much of his research has been in collaboration with Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the aquaculture industry, including the development of commercialization of protocols for producing sterile triploid populations of salmon, char, and cod, and all female popu populations of halibut. He has also served two terms as president of the Aquaculture Association of Canada. So if aquaculture is your business, this is the panel to listen to. Thank you, all three of you, for joining us. So to get started, Eric, why don't you share your presentation with us? And then I have a couple of questions. After that, we can come to our audience. Take it away. Thank you so much. Can everyone see my screen properly? Hopefully. Good to go. All right. All right. Yes. Uh, thank you again for the introduction, Bohan. Um, and thank you to the Harris Center for, of course, providing this funding opportunity, but um, also giving me this opportunity today uh, to tell you all a little bit about my research. Uh, so thank you all for attending. Uh, so the title of uh, this project was Protecting Atlantic Salmon Aquaculture Production from Climate-Related Challenges Through Diet Manipulation. So as a bit of background, uh, if you're not familiar, aquaculture production has been growing steadily over the past couple of decades uh, here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, and that is only expected to increase, especially through the arrival of Grieg and L in the province. And so I know that there are hopes that production can be doubled within the next five to 10 years. And of course, uh, this has you know, large economic benefits, um, but it particularly benefits uh, more rural uh, coastal communities here in Newfoundland where uh, the aquaculture industry, particularly the Atlantic salmon aquaculture industry uh, is able to provide a large number of jobs uh, for people in those communities. But what potential threats exist to salmon aquaculture? Well, one of those threats and uh, the main focus of my PhD research is the threat of climate change. So we know that uh, ocean uh, surface temperatures are on the rise and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future. And we also know that marine heat waves are increasing uh, in both frequency and duration. Uh, each year. And so these uh, present uh, quite the large challenges for the Atlantic salmon aquaculture industry um, as the species uh, is typically not uh, very tolerant of high temperatures. And so how can we help mitigate the impact of these challenges? And so there's a few different options that are uh, potentially available. Uh, so the first being selective breeding. Uh, so just over time, generally selecting uh, fish that are known to be more thermally tolerant than others. Similarly, you could potentially use new genetic strains. If you know uh, one strain from a different region is more tolerant to high temperatures, uh, you could potentially import them if that's not an issue. Uh, you can also make changes in how you manage your farm and how you uh, rear your fish. Uh, so a couple examples of that would be to uh, potentially increase the depth of your sea cage net pens out in the ocean. Uh, that would allow for more um, space available for salmon, uh, as crowding is typically an issue during high temperatures and low oxygen conditions. Uh, separately, you could potentially reduce stocking densities in your sea cages for similar reasons. Um, however, uh, there are costs associated with that, uh, as if you lower your densities, uh, you might not uh, reach the same uh, market potential. Um, and then the last of these options would be the, to alter the nutrition of these salmon. And so this would be changing the diet that is provided to these farmed salmon. And so that was the focus of this project. And so this uh, study had a few different objectives. 
all in relation to the impact of providing additional dietary cholesterol to these salmon. So we first wanted to see if uh, providing supplemental dietary cholesterol could improve salmon survival at high temperatures. Secondly, to improve their fillet coloration, as it has been reported in the past that during uh, high temperatures in summer months, uh, that this leads to what is called fillet bleaching, uh, where they lose pigmentation in their fillet muscle. Uh, and this ultimately impacts the marketability of uh, that product at harvest. And then the last item uh, that we wanted to measure would be, could dietary cholesterol help improve fish health or immune function? So to just quickly go through the study design, uh, so we used uh, female triploid or sterile Atlantic salmon uh, sourced from Okabani, Canada and uh, Prince Edward Island. And so these salmon uh, would be reflective of those that Grieg uh, intends to uh, stock into Placentia Bay. And so we had these fish uh, distributed equally among nine tanks. We initially reared them at 12 degrees and fed them a control diet, uh, which is uh, very similar to a regular commercial salmon feed diet. Uh, then we slowly increase temperature up to 16 degrees. Uh, you'll notice this rate at 0 0.2 degrees a day. Uh, and this was done to mimic natural conditions that these fish uh, would be expected to experience uh, in Placentia Bay. Uh, at 16 degrees, we then switched uh, three tanks onto our first experimental diet and three tanks onto our second experimental diet, each providing additional dietary cholesterol. We then went up to 18 degrees and held for an extended period of time. And then at this end period, we assessed fish and we also performed an immune challenge, uh, whereby fish were either injected with a commercial vaccine uh, called Forte Micro, which is uh, known to elicit an antibacterial response or poly-IC, which is an innate immune agonist known to elicit a potent antiviral response. And so with this experiment, we were able to assess both antibacterial and antiviral responses in these fish uh, in regard to the amount of dietary cholesterol provided. And then in remaining fish, they continued onwards in temperature at that same gradual rate of increase until they reached their incremental thermal maximum. And so when each dietary treatment reached 50% uh, of this IT max, uh, then the trial was concluded. So for this funding and uh, for this project, uh, we really wanted to uh, target and make this applicable to the Buren region. And so, as I mentioned, we were able to match, match the uh, temperature profile in Placentia Bay uh, for, during that transition from spring to summer, so the gradual increase of 0 0.2 degrees Celsius per day. We also used the sterile or triploid female Atlantic salmon, uh, similar to Grieg and L. And this ultimately helps with the goal because uh, we want to help the local industry grow sustainably in light of climate change. So just to quickly go through some of the main results, uh, when we assess weight gain at 18 degrees, we found the diet, so whether it was the control diet or whether it was in fish uh, fed additional dietary cholesterol, this did not impact weight gain at elevated temperature. However, it is noteworthy that only 58.7% of fish actually gained weight uh, since their assessment point at 16 degrees. And so we actually had a large proportion of fish lose weight. Um, so this is of course a negative outcome, um, but this really shows that uh, the industry must be proactive in light of climate change, because even at sublethal temperatures, you're, you can still see large negative impacts on your fish population. And if we compare salmon survival at the high temperatures, so we went to 50% mortality in each dietary treatment, uh, you can see that uh, 
there's very minimal differences uh, between uh, the endpoints for each dietary group. Um, and then if we actually compare the mean values within the first 50% of fish that reach their IT max or incremental thermal maximum, um, we actually see that there's a suggestion that high levels of dietary cholesterol may negatively impact survival. Um, so actually doing the opposite of what we hoped it would. And then, uh, so this is actually different uh, from what you'll find in the report, because uh, we reanalyzed some of the data uh, and found um, a different result uh, from what we initially reported. Uh, but what we did find was that when we look at the color of the fillet, uh, so that's the muscle tissue, uh, as we increase in temperature and as the fish are growing, we're increasing in coloration at 16 and 18 degrees. And then at this 50% mortality point, we actually see a decrease in the control treatment and then a stagnant response uh, in the two experimental dietary treatments. And so while not effective in all fish, as you'll see, um, fillet bleaching was at least reduced in fish that were fed the supplemental cholesterol. And so this is one benefit that we did find in this experiment so far. Uh, but we still have lots of ongoing analyses. Uh, so a lot of these are very close to completion. Uh, hopefully I will have the results uh, within the next month or two, uh, but we'll be looking uh, within that fillet muscle, looking at lipid and fatty acid composition, of course, with particular interest to cholesterol, but also omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, looking at the antiviral and antibacterial immune responses between fish, uh, fed different levels of dietary cholesterol. And then the last thing would be to look at metabolic and heat stress gene regulation. Uh, so uh, I think all of these things will be really interesting as we move forward. But to conclude, our main findings so far from the results that we have is that we do find that female triploid Atlantic salmon sourced from Akabani do not experience high numbers of mortalities until greater than 22 degrees. And so this does suggest that you can rear triploid Atlantic salmon in places like Placentia Bay, where temperature you know, typically only gets as high as 18 degrees uh, at the moment. Um, and so this does suggest that temperature at least won't uh, be a main factor uh, for uh, negative outcomes. But we did find that providing additional di dietary cholesterol uh, only has minimal effects on thermal tolerance um, and even may potentially negatively influence at high enough inclusion levels. But dietary cholesterol uh, being supplemented was successful in preventing fillet bleaching, so uh, retaining pigment uh, after prolonged exposure to these elevated temperatures tested in this study. So of course, I would like to thank the Harris Center again uh, for this funding opportunity, um, as well as all my collaborators uh, at Memorial University, as well as Dr. Stephanie Colombo at Dalhousie uh, and Dr. Sean Tibbetts at the NRC. Uh, this project was also supported through funding through NSERC and uh, through the MIXA program, uh, who has a variety of uh, program sponsors and partners. So that's it for me. And I look forward to any questions people may have. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, maybe I can open with a um, few questions. Uh, so let's start with you, actually, since you just gave us this great presentation. Uh, your research was part of the uh, ocean health and seafood opportunities theme that the uh, folks in the Burien region uh, identified as important to their future development. Um, given your findings, what is the angle you would take in terms of further re strategies, research strategies and adaptation strategies for the industry in the region um, in Placentia Bay? Yeah, so 
even with uh, us finding that dietary cholesterol, you know, didn't improve thermal tolerance, um, you know, it is important to kind of knock it off the list. Um, there are still uh, tons of other uh, different dietary manipulations that have still to be tested. Um, so certainly uh, that would be a great place to start. Um, and also potentially looking into the genetics of uh, these fish. Uh, and that work is actually ongoing um, because we found fish uh, from this population to be more thermally tolerant uh, than others that have been tested within Atlantic Canada. Uh, we have a couple of questions for you in the chat. Before we go to them, um, I wanted to ask Danny, uh, as we heard from, uh, from Eric, the aquaculture industry in the province has certainly grown over the years and uh, it's poised to, to potentially double production over the next five to 10 years. Um, can you give us a sense of the importance of the industry to the province and the role that Memorial University plays in supporting the industry? Sure, well, I'll, I'll certainly uh, speak to it. Uh, Memorial University, which includes the Marine Institute, has led the development of the aquaculture industry in Newfoundland, uh, you know, since the 70s, as an example. Uh, the Marine Science Research Laboratory opened in 67. And, and in the early 1970s, you know, there were mussel site assessments, uh, there was scallop aquaculture, uh, there was Atlantic salmon at the Hydro at Beta Spear, started trout research, started. So a lot of things were initiated in the early days of aquaculture, mm. sort of pioneering, I guess, uh, many years ago. Uh, so the activity continues today through through ongoing, uh, you know, aquaculture research at the Department of Ocean Sciences and also at the Marine Institute Center for Aquaculture and Seafood Development. Uh, current, uh, you know, we've, we've moved from uh, our traditional species, uh, salmon, trout, uh, and blue mussels. And over the years, we've moved into uh, Atlantic cod. We've done things with Atlantic halibut, flounders, ocean pouts, wolffish, you know, all, all the species that predominantly are, are first and foremost important to our province and to our region. Uh, we've moved into lumpfish, arctic chars, sea urchins. So, you know, with the vast expertise we have at Memorial to our researchers, incorporating our students, incorporating our facilities, having, uh, you know, centers like the Canadian Center for Fishery, Fisheries Innovations here at Memorial, uh, we've got a very strong, dedicated program and team for teaching and education, research and development in support of the industry that as uh, sort of Eric alluded to at the beginning of his uh, presentation is, you know, we're, we're, we're moving in, in volume within the province. We've the last couple of years, we've dropped off a little bit, but again, we, we do have ambitions of wanting to get to, you know, 50,000 metric tons of Atlantic salmon. And now with uh, Grieg and, 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 you know, we've got Grieg, Moly and Cook. We've got the three of the largest salmon farming companies in the world here actively with farming licenses in the province. We have a very dedicated blue mussel industry. Uh, we've had, you know, we're moving into uh, oyster development. So uh, we, we're well, you know, we're well positioned to a certain uh, uh, increased production over the number of years and continue a strong foothold uh, here at Memorial University and playing a role uh, for, for our industry and working with the Newfoundland Aquaculture Industry Association as well and the Air Atlantic Partners. Thank you. Um, folks, our connection here at Signal Hill Campus is a little wonky today. So periodically turn off my camera hoping that it um, actually fixes itself. Um, before I, I want to open another line of sort of discussion before we go to the questions. And uh, Tillman, actually a question for you. Um, climate change is obviously going to have a huge impact on the industry uh, worldwide. Uh, and the industry is actually huge. Uh, about half of our seafood worldwide comes from aquaculture. Um, so what are avenues that internationally researchers in the industry are pursuing in terms of adaptation uh, and mitigation of climate change impacts? Yeah, um, 
Just before I answer that, I just, I'd like to uh, thank the Harris Center for inviting me to participate in, in this. I, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Te you know, temperature specifically and, and climate change in general is a, is a concern anywhere we do aquaculture. And uh, when we think of climate change, it's not just temperature in the marine environment, it's, it's oxygen levels, it's uh, frequency and severity of storms, it's changes in distributions of pathogens and parasites and, and harmful algae. These are all being affected. Um, affects the salmon aquaculture industry, wherever that happens, affects, affects other types of aquaculture as well. So uh, we really need to look at this. Uh, there's a lot, of, <clears throat> a lot of opportunities and a lot of need for research like, like Eric has been talking about. And uh, you know, just a few things that come to mind, uh, areas of importance for research and, and areas where things are happening, for instance, are uh, just a better ability to model and predict changes on, on small scales, on, on local scales. You know, I, I think most of our models are very large scale, but from the perspective of salmon farming, for instance, in Newfoundland, we need to be able to do modeling on very small scale. And we also need to do a better job predicting uh, extreme events. So not this sort of gradual increase in temperature or gradual increase in acidity, but what, uh, what Eric called heat waves, for instance, these sort of uh, short-term extreme events that are added on top of that. Um, I think um, important areas for research that are, that are ongoing are uh, understanding underlying mechanisms uh, that determine the ability of salmon or other fish to survive environmental extremes like temperature. So what, what, are, the, what are the underlying mechanisms that cause them to, uh, to die or to pour poorly? And, and for temperature, you know, we, we don't really know. Um, we, we know temperature, high temperature is an issue, but what is it actually doing to the fish? There's a lot of uncertainty, whether it's related to oxygen availability or changes in cell membranes or you know, biochemical effects. So that's an active area of research. And um, looking at gene expression is a very important part of that. Uh, so Eric, I look forward to seeing some of the gene expression data from your study. And, and that's sort of getting, a, getting a handle on underlying mechanisms, I think, gives us the opportunity to then do research on improving fish performance in aquaculture, including for temperature. And, and really, to my mind, there are two key areas, and, and Eric already mentioned them. Uh, one is genetic improvement, just, just through breeding, you know, just through selection. We, we know that there's variation uh, among populations of Atlantic salmon and temperature tolerance. So we should be able to incorporate that into breeding programs for aquaculture. And, and that's something that we always have to do in aquaculture. It doesn't stop tomorrow. We, you know, we always have to do genetic improvement in aquaculture. The other thing that we always have to do, and again, Eric spoke nicely about this, is uh, improve diet formulations. So, you know, maybe cholesterol, interesting idea, maybe that's not the right one, you know, we'll see. But that's not to say that there's not a role for nutritional research. There will always be a role for nutritional research. Uh, and, and there is evidence that diet manipulation or, or diet uh, supplementation can improve temperature performance. I, I'm not honestly sure. I, I don't know whether that's been shown for Atlantic salmon specifically, but certainly for other species of fish. The, uh, and one last area, I guess, of uh, research that I'll mention uh, is, is uh, consideration of recirculating aquaculture systems where we actually remove the fish from environmental vari variation you know, in net pens by, uh, by recirculating the, the water where we can control everything very effectively. So that's, that's another very active area of research. Uh, to be honest, it, it has yet to prove itself on a commercial scale for Atlantic salmon, but certainly re recirculating aquaculture systems give the opportunity to control temperature and other environmental parameters very well uh, and sort of get away from these climate change effects. I guess <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have quite a few questions. So Chris, why don't you take it from here and uh, get us to the first one or two? Okay, thanks. Um, and there's a couple that I, I'm gonna lump together and I, I think all our panelists can see the questions. 
Um, but so if you're reading along with me, there's one from Steer and one from Daniel that are both sort of looking at this, you know, what happens at 16 degrees? There seems to be this bimodal effect. Um, Sierra so asked, you know, is this the same result expected for the European all-female triploids that Greg Greg is using? And then Daniel's asking, sort of, you know, what, you know, what seems to be driving that? Do you have anything more to say um, around what's, you know, why might there be this bimodal effect? So maybe Eric, we'll start with you, and then Danny and Tillman, if you want to jump in after Eric, feel free. Sure. Um, yeah. So uh, thanks for the questions, uh, Sierra and Daniel. Um, yeah, so Sear, to kind of address uh, your point first, um, so this was at 18 degrees, uh, probably should clarify that, uh, where we saw that half the population uh, or nearly half the population lost weight. Um, and yeah, you, you do raise an important point. So the fish that I tested in my study were St. John River uh, origin. Uh, so, you know, these came from Atlantic Canada. Uh, Grieg uh, is getting they're at stock from Stauffenfisker in Iceland, so it's a European strain. And so there certainly could be differences uh, in performance. Um, and so that would of course be another extremely valuable area um, to even compare performance of triploids um, between separate populations or between separate strains. Um, so that is a really important point. Um, it, it was just unfortunate that uh, you know, we couldn't get any access uh, to those uh, types of fish for this experiment. And then as for drivers uh, between the, the bimodal distribution, um, yeah, we're, we're really not sure. Um, so there shouldn't have been a risk of it being a behavioral aspect of fish out competing. Um, because we did feed the tanks to satiation twice daily. And so we did that uh, in order to provide all the fish in the tank ample opportunity to be feeding, um, you know, a couple times a day. Uh, so I, I doubt that would be the cause. And then uh, you also mentioned maybe potential genetic differences. Um, that is a possibility. Um, so all of the fish in this experiment were all half siblings. Uh, so that def definitely limited the genetic variability that we could see. Um, but there, there is the potential because we it was a cross between one neomale parent and uh, numerous uh, female parents um, that there could have been variation driven by the female parentage. Sarah, can anybody want to add that, Gilman or Danny? Yeah, I guess um, I, I could add something to that, but also I've got a follow-up question for Eric. <laughs> uh, I guess just one thing to point out, I think Sierra raises a good point about um, uh, North American versus European sources of fish, and, and maybe there, there might be an influence there on temperature tolerance. But also just to point out that um, uh, Grieg is required to use sterile fish, but uh, other growers in Newfoundland are using non-sterile diploid salmon. And, and my own experience, and, and I think also experience from others, is that, that diploid fish, not, not, not the triploids, tend to be slightly better performers at higher temperature. So, so they may do a little bit better, you know, in these high temperature events than triploids, but really we're talking about literally a, you know, maybe a degree difference, not a big difference. Um, uh, Eric, I was also wondering, so that bimodality I found really interesting as well. Um, do, you, do, you, do you know, or do you have any sense of whether those the fish that uh, did not do well, the, the fish that lost weight, whether they maybe had not smolted properly? Um, I mean, all the fish were smolted at the exact same time. Um, all fish were given the exact same conditions. Yeah. Um, so did yeah, they, so I, I doubt it, but yeah. you never know. <laughs> did, uh, did any of the fish that lost weight, did they lose their silvery appearance? Like, did they start to show par marks again? Did they, did they keep that smolt appearance or, or post smolt appearance? Um, 
certainly from what I can remember is that that no, that everyone kind of kept their their silvery sheen. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess also I, I just uh, uh, point out I you know it's it's not a true bimodal distribution. You know, it's you're always going to have well performing and poor performing individuals in, in that kind of a distribution. So there's any number of reasons that could occur, and, and genetics could be one potential reason, but not the only. Yeah. I'm gonna, Danny. Unless there's something specific you want to add, I'm gonna jump in and ask another couple of questions. But go for it if you have something you want. No, like. no, you go right ahead. I get nothing specific. Okay, I'm gonna actually jump down the list. But for those of you who are kind of further up, don't worry, we'll come back to you. But I wanted to, um, Tillman, you had mentioned this idea of circulation as one sort of strategy or option, and that was one of the questions that Velma asked. You know, this idea of you know, uh, is there, you know, pumped water in cages, decreased to water temperature, fist cages. So what, uh, what's the linkage, you know, between the water circulation and the nutrition and maybe Tillman, if you want to talk sort of generally, and then Eric, I don't know if that had any specific comment uh, to related to your research that might be, but Velma brings up this question around sort of the, what impact sort of improved circulation might have on the survival rates. Yeah, and I, I guess my comment was specifically to, to closed systems, really recirculating water within closed systems, whereas I think this question is about pumping uh, in, in open systems, pumping water into cages, which is uh, potentially a, a solution. You know, uh, moving water requires a lot of energy, isn't, isn't cheap, but there's ways around that. Um, so pumping colder water is a potential solution, but you, you just you need to make sure that it's still good quality water in the sense of maybe the temperature is good, but for instance, what are oxygen levels like? But it's a definitely a possibility. Thanks. All right, I'm gonna jump back up into Stephanie's question. Um, so given that too much cholesterol may not be as beneficial as we thought, do we have to be careful about the level of cholesterol that is included? You know, how much is too much? So I guess, you know, is there, is there further research that needs to be done sort of looking at different levels or has that already been done before? So Eric, maybe start with you on that one. Sure. Uh, thanks for the question, Stephanie. Um, so as you know, cause you're involved in this experiment. Um, so our two uh, levels of additional dietary cholesterol uh, were the first being 1.3% added and the second being 1.76% added. Um, so certainly um, I mean, it wasn't definitive, but there was some evidence to suggest that at that highest level, um, that that could potentially have some negative effects on survival. Um, but pretty much the control treatment and um, the first experimental diet treatment with the 1.3% added uh, were pretty much identical in almost every uh, factor that I assessed. Um, so certainly I don't think that there is any danger posed at that level. Um, but, you know, whether it would be worthwhile uh, to invest in that in additional dietary cholesterol, because it can be an expensive uh, feed ingredient, uh, kind of remains to be determined. And so kind of hopefully with um, some of these uh, remaining results that we have to get, uh, that will kind of be able to make that uh, decision. Great, thanks, Eric. And I'm going to jump down to the the very last question we got. And actually, Danny, I'm going to direct this to you, but maybe in a slightly different way. So Steve asks, or Steve comments, that the key to mitigating climate change is that we approach is depending upon the site location and, and historical environmental conditions and nutrition, name a few. So kind of site specific and. And, you know, Newfoundland's got a lot of sites and a lot of different, potentially a lot of different conditions. I'm curious from your experience with the MUN research community, what do you, do you see the, the, the MUN community sort of working in different places and different ways with, you know, different uh, aquaculture, you know, sites that, you know, give us the potential to be able to come up with some of those varying conditions? What's, what's your take on what we see happening here in Newfoundland from a research perspective? Oh, certainly, and, and a great question, Steve. Uh, as I, you know, said from the onset, Memorial started with site selection more, more primarily for the uh, shellfish sector. But again, we've, you know, worked a lot in the ocean uh, sector. 
looking at uh, site selection. And as Steve pointed out, you just can't put fish or shellfish in, in any particular bay and expect to be profitable and, and have healthy fish. But at the same token, you look for sites that have, uh, you know, good temperatures, uh, you, you know, site conditions, high energy, medium energy, low energy, uh, good flushing rates. Uh, you know, we have a bay management program where sites had to be a certain distance from each other. So, you know, it's a bay management type of thing. But, uh, you know, go back to the basics. You, you know, you, you feed your animals when the conditions are right. And the conditions being the right temperature, the right oxygen, the right time of the day with the currents, with the new technology, we have cameras below and above water. The last thing we want to do is to, to waste feed, which is the most cost, you know, the most costly thing for, for uh, salmon farming and whatnot. So, you know, you, you're, you're trying to build the body of the animal versus uh, the animal uh, having a lot of fecal matter. Uh, you know, the behavior, behavior of fish, uh, understanding behavior of fish. You have people now that are feeding these fish through remote operated systems and sitting in a room with lots of monitors, modern, monitoring the behavior of, of a salmon. Same as you would do with your own, own animals at home. You sort of know when they're hungry. You get patterns. You see what's right. You see what's wrong. FCRs, you know, we, we, we strive for an FCR in our salmon uh, industry around here of trying to get 1.2, meaning, you know, you, you feed uh, 1.2 you know, kil kilograms of feed and you're, you know, uh, you're, you're trying to get a, a kilo of growth. The Faroe Islands are probably the best in the world. If one to one, we're getting about 1.2. We've got to feed 1.2 kilos of uh, salmon pellets to get a, a kilo of body, body flesh per se on the fillet. Uh, Remind everybody, salmon, you know, they're neutral, buoyancy, they're cold-blooded animals. Uh, as we feed fish, uh, salmon, we get a 1.2 FCR. Uh, poultry, you're 1.6. Pork, you're 3. Beef and cattle, you're 8 to 9. So we're working with a good species to, to certainly uh, to get a good product out to the marketplace, uh, you know, as, as a footprint of environmental footprint. Back to Tillman's points earlier, you know, new technologies, uh, as, as there is a demand globally for RES technology on land, uh, that's not proven uh, specifically yet. The taste is not there, the price per kilo is not there. I'm sure they will make great inroads, great new developments, and there will be a place for uh, land-based operations. But here in Newfoundland, we're, we're sea-based, ocean-based uh, salmon farming industry. There's going to be new technology. We welcome the changes here at Memorial with, uh, you know, closed containment cages that whereby, again, we can pump water from cooler, cooler depths. We can uh, use new, new mesh technology to minimize the amount of sea lice that gets in on our salmon. Uh, we can, you know, remove the fecal matter uh, through, through various drum filters. Uh, and, and, you know, there's oceans of opportunity for researchers and students at Memorial within, you know, Atlantic Canada and Canada and international, uh, moving forward on the, you know, salmon sector, but also the shellfish sector. Thank you, Danny. You're welcome. Eric or Tillman, anything you would want to add on sort of this idea of you know, having to be very site specific when you're kind of either doing the research or actually trying to implement the findings of the research? Yeah, I just to say, um, I agree absolutely with Danny. You know, there, the, the, there are common problems that we're facing everywhere, but the solutions are going to be different in different locations. So it's a good point. Great. Okay. Well, last question, then I'm going to turn it back to Boyan. And uh, I'm not, I hope I don't do the name that, that poorly, but I'll get a trend. Gianluca uh, is asked about the bleaching and asks Eric, uh, which type of color bleaching did you observe? Was it localized on the, the fillet or have you done any analysis on the flesh? So a question around sort of that part of your research. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so far I'll, uh, I've analyzed is the, the SAMO fan color. Um, so that's uh, is a very basic visual assessment of uh, the fillet pigmentation, um, but we do follow a standardized approach. Um, but we are uh, looking at uh, actually quantifying 
uh, the level of astaxanthin, uh, which would be the primary pigment uh, found in salmon flesh. Um, so looking at quantifying that and seeing, you know, if we can get um, a kind of a more precise reading on that. Um, but yeah, so basically with this color bleaching, it's it's just a reduction in pigment. So, you know, if you typically go to the supermarket and you see a fillet of Atlantic salmon, it's that nice bright orange color. Um, that's the color that most consumers uh, find attractive. Um, but what we found at uh, exposure to elevated temperatures was just that it diminished slightly. So, um, you know, these fish uh, were still actively growing. They weren't anywhere near harvest weight. Um, so we didn't expect them to have, you know, super dark pigmentation, um, but what um, level of pigmentation they did have, uh, they were starting to lose it. So uh, just turning to a more pale orange color. Um, and it was fairly uniform um, across the fillets, um, both centrally located and on the peripheral edges of the muscle. Thanks, Eric. Boyan, back to you. Okay, and uh, as the moderator, I'm going to reserve the right to ask the last question. Uh, Danny, actually, I want to follow up with something you mentioned, and I would be interested to hear what uh, Tilman, you have to say about that as well. Um, you mentioned that, you know, uh, on land aquaculture may uh, be an option in some places. Um, through some work here at the Harris Center um, with agricultural um, groups on the island, um, there is a lot of talk because of the impacts of climate change and unpredictable large weather events um, that agriculture may have to move to some sort of um, controlled environment agriculture. It, are those similar conversations held at the aquaculture industry? Uh, are we looking at um, you know, much more controlled environments that would allow us to mitigate some of those impacts of climate change? Uh, the quick answer would be yes. Uh, obviously, you want to protect your investment as shareholders, as large companies. Uh, you don't. You want to protect the environment. You're in the ocean and whatnot. But certainly, you know, from a realistic point of view, if we're going to go land-based, we won't have an industry, in my opinion, here in Newfoundland. You're so far removed from the marketplace. Why would it make sense to have land-based facilities? away from the marketplace when you can have them in Hawaii, you can have them in the US, you can have them outside of Montreal maybe, but it's, you know, so there's pros and cons of this. We, we have an ocean-based technology that works with new technologies and their vastness to access to oceans. There's no reason why this can't work in the ocean. It's working now. We can make improvements. There may come a point in time that some species that may not be conducive to ocean-based farming that you may choose to do on land, i.e. you may do halibut on land, you may do wolf fish on land, you may do sea urchins on land, you may, you know, so it, there, there's, there's many species and, and it is, you know, a system specific, a specific uh, that will drive uh, the shareholder investments in the marketplace. And if the investments want to invest in RES technology, which they have done quite a bit in the last number of years, but again, don't believe that everything on land is going to work. It's going to take years of research and development to make improvements. There's a lot of electricity required. You've got numerous pumps, there could be issues. There's the price. What is it going to cost to grow this species uh, in a land-based environment? And then sort of rare, you know, talk is gone, it's taste. Are you going to grow these salmon in artificial salt water or sort of fresh water when they're used to salt water? Or are you still going to pump the water from the ocean to a land-based facility? So there's, there's all kinds of opportunities and different models out there that may work for certain areas. Uh, 
if I can add that, to that, that uh, I agree completely with Danny that uh, it's, it's really, it's not proven. You know, it, it, it sounds good and it has certainly some advantages, but to farm salmon on the scale that we currently do in net pens, you know, that has yet to be shown to work in these land-based recirculating systems. And, and they do solve some problems, but they create other problems. So it's, it's not, uh, it's not a, a solution to everything. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to bring your attention to, to Daniel's last question that involves this question around net pens. I don't know if you want to pick that up or not. Um, well, why don't you do it? Okay. Uh, Daniel says, in BC, there's a strong push from regulatory agencies and the public to remove sea-based net pens. Do you see this becoming an issue in Newfoundland? I can uh, do my best. Uh, do I see it to be an issue? No. Uh, is there small you know, discussions ongoing, yes. There, there, are, there are people that's going to be against ocean-based aquaculture regardless, but our public perception, all the polls we've done through the Newfoundland Aquaculture Industry Association is that we have strong support for aquaculture as it stands. We are a sea-based farming-based ocean. Uh, whether it be uh, commercial fisheries and or aquaculture, we share the resource, which is the ocean, quite good. Are there room for improvements? Always. Are there room for new innovations? Always. Uh, we can't compare uh, British Columbia uh, to Newfoundland per se. There's, they have a wild Pacific salmon. Uh, we used to have an Atlantic salmon until the 60s and 70s. Uh, we still have some you know, small wild commercial runs in certain rivers within the province. We're very aware of that. We're gonna work with the indigenous groups but uh, I, I think the federal government, uh, fish, fisheries, federal fisheries minister was uh, quietly in town last week. Uh, and, and we've, as an association, uh, have not heard anything that, you know, we're going to be challenged. Our province is open for business for agriculture. And uh, I don't see it any different in the near future, to be quite honest. Already before we close, any last comments from our panelists or questions for each other? Uh, okay. Thank you to Eric. Great job. Uh, okay. Thank you to the audience. Uh, great questions. And, uh, you know, we had 30, 30 people that uh, sort of uh, wanted to watch this today. And uh, I think we have a very promising uh, aquaculture industry. and in Atlantic Canada and going forward and strong companies. And, uh, you know, it is all about food security here at Memorial, teaching and education, research and development. We will be here to help. Thank you. That sounds like a great note to end on. Um, I just gonna say thanks. Thanks for a great uh, discussion. And I wanted to thank three of you, and especially you, Eric, for the presentation and for your participation in the panel. We really appreciate that uh, you are willing to put yourself out there. It's not always easy, especially on uh, sometimes complicated issues like aquaculture and climate change. Um, I want to remind everybody that you can hear, you can find out more about the Thriving Regions Partnership Process, our uh, flagship regional development program here at Memorial University at, at the Harris Center website. And you can see other projects that uh, were funded through that process besides Eric's. Um, and I also want to remind you that today's sessions uh, session will be available on the Harris Center uh, website in a couple of days. Uh, but most importantly, I want to thank uh, all of you in the audience for your comments, for your questions. Uh, we obviously just scratched the surface and these conversations have to um, continue and uh, we have a lot more work to do. Uh, but this was a great start. So we are always looking forward from hearing from all of you. And I hope that you guys have a great rest of the day. See you all. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.